liar pants on fire when it comes to Omid Scobie because it seems like every time he opens his mouth to promote his book Endgame, he continues to get stuck in it, stuck in his own narrative and potentially lies regarding the publication of this book and perhaps his involvement with leaking a copy that shared the names of the two royals who allegedly made comments about Archie's skin color. And if this was concocted as a publicity stunt, I've got to say, Collins International, this is very, very despicable work here. This is nasty, nasty work in order to sell a book. And I think it's pretty despicable. But what's also really interesting is to watch Omid Scobie go in interviews, get caught in misinformation and lies, and him struggling to explain things because he does things pretty well. But in his interview with This Morning on ITV, he was pressed pretty hard about some issues. And at one point, he even went, you could see this frustration come out in him. And I'm like, buddy, you only have yourself to blame because he cannot answer these questions accurately or well. He meanders around them sometimes. He misleads you and tries to bring up something else. And I don't think everybody is catching on to this. I mean, a lot of people are, but there's also interesting things in the words he's using that I think distract from the fact that he definitely for sure put those two names in the book because they have actually been confirmed basically by the Sussex camp as the names in the letter. This is, if this was planned and concocted again by the publisher and Omid Scobie, this is absolutely despicable, horrific tactics to be using in order to sell a book. 100% gotta say that right now. And I think Omid Scobie's reputation is a thousand percent on the line. Sure, this book might sell a bit more because of all this controversy, which I think is rather stupid because the text that was wrong was actually in the Dutch version, not even in the English version. So why are you buying the English version if the allegations aren't even in it? That's just dumb. But I think we really do need to talk about this because this is very, very serious. And what Omid Scobie is doing here, I just think is absolutely despicable. And I think Harry and Meghan, or especially Meghan, are 100% in on this. And this is going to end disastrously for them because I will end on this. The Times of London came out strong against Harry and Meghan, basically saying to the monarchy, enough is enough. You need to do something about them. Pull the titles. That's basically what the editorial board of the Times of London said. And I 100% agree. Charles can no longer deal with them with kid gloves. They need to be dealt with seriously anymore because this problem is getting bad. And it's so sad to see a family be mercilessly, people be mercilessly attacked for what were probably very innocent comments. And again, I think it's completely and utterly despicable. And so this may be a bit of a longer video, but let's get into it. And if you guys haven't been here, my name is Brittany and I talk about all this royal stuff because I enjoy it and I think it's a lot of fun. And I love analyzing things and letting people know maybe what some of the truth people aren't saying. So if you guys want to subscribe, that would be fantastic. Also, if you're interested in my jewelry, links for that will be down below too. Okay, so let's get started. So this was on this morning on ITV. So the hosts for that day were Allison Hammond and Craig Doyle. I think Craig did a really, really good job pressing Omid on certain issues and his responses. And I think he was very good at setting up the question. So I actually give him a big thumbs up. Allison wasn't quite as involved asking questions. I think she asked one or two. A lot of this though was really Craig and Craig apparently did read a good chunk of the book and he had some pretty good comebacks for Omid when it came to certain things. And so I just want to preface this right now. I will try to remember to link the full interview in my description box because I would encourage you to watch it. It was actually a very good interview, I thought. They couldn't go, it wasn't super hardball, but definitely was not softball either. And Omid, again, was very uncomfortable in certain sections. And I think that's pretty key here because that's what the interview needed to be. I even thought the BBC one I saw on Nightline was a little bit, maybe even a bit softer, although they did go after Omid on things too. And I will say, I know there was some comments uh, uh, from him about how all the online harassment he gets and apparently some death threats. Nobody should be doing anything like that. But at the same time, I think he deserves a lot of the criticism he's getting and he's perfectly comfortable dismissing it and telling us all we're crazy and he's the savior of the universe. Because what you'll notice throughout this is a, it's a lot about Omid, it's a lot about his savior complex, and he is very much like Meghan Markle. He deflects from the 
accurate criticism he's receiving and goes, well, it's about race. And I'm like, no, it's not. And you're already reporting only one side of the equation. There's a reason why you didn't last more than a year at Yahoo. There's a good reason for that. So let's, like I said, let's get into it. Look, we're two days into the book being out now, two yeah. or three days. The reaction has been, well, kind of fierce, hasn't it? The public are unhappy. Yeah. The press have been hard. And some of the reviews haven't been great. I'm just wondering how your week's been so far. So thank, well, thank you for asking. So I wanted to pull out that first bit because I felt like it was so Meghan Markle there. Because remember, nobody asked me if I'm doing okay. Very much reminded me of that. And again, he's getting heat for a badly written book. He's getting criticism for not going after Harry and Meghan when he should and said very strictly and very bitingly criticizing Catherine and William. And so I think most of the criticism for him has been deserved. And obviously people go into other things, but if you look at the content of his work and what he's saying here in this, throughout this interview, you'll notice he's just not really a reputable guy at all. I knew this book would be controversial. It obviously goes into areas that I think that often royal correspondents shy away from, whether it's conversations around race or of course the relationship between the press and the palace, but really going into the details of that. And so what's kind of interesting here is that, you know, he's talking about, of course, this was about race, you know, because all the criticism about this book, like all the criticism against Meghan Markle is all about race, but that's not really the case. And of course the book wouldn't be received well. It wasn't written well. It wasn't done well. It was researched with a strict and severe bias in mind. And because of that, it is reflected in the reviews that are saying it's not very good. It's repetitive. It's things we've already heard before. Nothing in this book is particularly interesting. So apparently, you know, maybe they decide to do a stunt in the Netherlands in order to generate more interest for something most people won't read. And he's going into this thing where he's like, he has this savior complex. He's the only one in the world who's going to tell you how it really works behind the scenes. He's the only one who's going to tell you the truth about what's going on. But the problem here is, is he's never been a, a, an official part of the Royal Rota. And what that means is the Royal Rota are the people who are specifically assigned by the major newspapers to follow the royals around. And he even goes in later in the interview and says he's been mostly working with U.S. publications. And so there is actually a big aspect of royal reporting that he does not know because he is not in those upper echelons, those upper circles of royal reporting. He is not part of the royal rota. So even when he's saying, well, I was a part of it and I, I know all these things that other people don't, I just don't even totally believe that because he's not really actually a part of that inner circle. But he wants to be and he thinks that he is. And this idea that nobody else goes into the details of the relationship between the palace and the press, there's a couple reasons for that. Sometimes it's probably actually not that interesting. And I think some people do like Courtier's, uh, the Valentine Lowe book, I think goes into a bit of those details. You know, we do hear them. So he's not the only one. And sometimes too, it's just simply a security issue. They can't tell you, well, I call so-and-so all the time for details because they need to protect so-and-so and what they're doing within the palace. There are certain reasons why certain things aren't made public. And I'm okay with that in some areas. But Omid, again, he thinks he's special and he's gonna give you something nobody else can. I never expected it to sort of be presented fairly on the pages of the same papers that the se their secrets are now being revealed for the first time. And of course, none of that has made any of the coverage. So I, when I see that, that really bothers me. Cause it's like, you wrote this book knowing it would be incendiary and knowing people wouldn't really look at it. You didn't write it well, you wrote it for headlines. And because of that, you're gonna get headlines, but they're not gonna be good headlines. And that's your fault. That is entirely your fault fault because you've made it about the headline, the reaction, all these sorts of things, rather than providing a good detailed analysis, you're writing for a reaction. So you get a reaction and it's not the one you particularly like. And so now you're going to complain about it, but you're the one who asked for it. So you can't do both of those things at the same time. Something has to give. And then you did refer look, to her as a Stepford wife though, which is kind of offensive too, isn't it, Om? It, there was a, it said Stepford wife like, A, that she's never put a, a step wrong, but also that the role does require that kind of stately detachment. So there's this ridiculous notion here. So he calls Catherine, the Princess of Wales, essentially a Stepford wife. And then he goes, no, 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 but she needs to have this regal th thing that she has to create some distance between her and the public. But that makes her Stepford, but she's not, but she's like, 
but she's not. She's like the queen. I was like, so Omid, are you saying the queen, Queen Elizabeth II was a Stepford wife? Because that's essentially what you said. That was essentially what you said. You essentially called Catherine and Queen Elizabeth Stepford wives, which I don't think either of them are. But yes, Catherine has to act in a regal dignity. She can't do what Meghan does, which is force hugs on people, force intimacy with people by touching them, trying to get them all close and show how warm she is. Catherine is royalty, so she acts appropriately to royalty. You will know if you've watched any royals throughout Europe that the vast majority of them are not very touchy-feely with people they're meeting. Meghan Markle is because she's trying to force intimacy and connection and force a warmth from her that's not really there. But of course, if you compare that to say everyday folk, there is a sort of like very reserved, almost Stepford-like approach to the, it's kind of to mean, the it's, position. It's, it, like for, it, it is a kind of a hard thing to say or to hear about yourself. And I, you can understand why there's been a, a lot of negative reaction. So I like it that Craig kind of gets to Omid Scooby on this. It's like, you said this, it's kind of mean. And you don't really seem to be understanding the fact that what you said is mean and people have a negative reaction to it. And Omid just, again, totally bypasses that. And you can see him throughout this interview. He is very uncomfortable in this interview. I don't think he comes across particularly well. Now he's not sweating profusely, but he's not happy either because he wants to promote his narrative. I think there's even one question in here, or maybe it was the Nightline interview, where he said, well, they didn't like my narrative. You're not supposed to be reporting a narrative. You're supposed to be reporting the news. There's a difference between the news and the narrative. There's a huge difference there. I've always said commentator. Well, I, I think I started out with journalists. Then I moved to commentator because I commentate on royals. So yes, sometimes I get to report because I'm there at particular events, so I report. But I prefer commenting because I, I want to give people a deeper insight into what they're seeing, what's going on. So he, I don't feel like he can really call himself a journalist or even an impartial observer because he's so partial. And also I think too, just saying she comes across as too detached to people who I've met her. I've had a selfie with her. I thought she was fantastic. I thought she was very warm and appropriate for the avenue she was at, which is a walkabout. And she's not supposed to be going around hugging people and stuff. I mean, I think she does from time to time, but she's very warm to people. And she does this small talk thing very well. And she does have to have a separation between herself and the public. Celebrities do too. You can't be all touchy feely and friendly, a la Meghan Markle with people because you need to create a sense of boundaries with the public. And I think Catherine does that well. And I think she is approachable. And I think this notion that she's not, that she's too cold and kind of distant, I think is very unfair of Omid. A lot of it feels like a bit of a hatchet job against the royal family, okay? And, you know, Harry and Meghan, they kind of are largely untouched from negativity from your pen in this. So, you know, a lot of the speculation is that you are a mouthpiece for Harry and yeah. Meghan. So what is your relationship with Harry and Meghan? I think it's great that he pointed this out because again, and Omid Scobie gets called on this again and again and again, and then he gets frustrated by it. And it's like, but you only ever report one side. You only ever report one side. And yes, there are things Catherine and William done that have been wrong. Like I think personally that the PR kind of mess that happened at the Women's World Cup with William and the palace and everything, they did not respond to that quickly enough. Either William should have gone or should have had a better excuse than, eh, I just want to spend time with my family. Not that that's a necessarily a bad excuse, but that excuse became harder when the Queen of Spain went over to the World Cup. I'm just saying I can see both sides to things, but Omid ever only looks at one side and then wonders why people think he's a mouthpiece. And he's always the first one to report certain things about Harry and Meghan. So we know he's getting stuff, exclusive stuff from them, and he's acting like he's not. He's acting like he's essentially any Joe Blow journalist that Harry and Meghan interact with, which is totally inaccurate. He is getting directly connected with Harry and Meghan and he's responding to them. I just, uh, it just bothers me so much that he's essentially lying about this. And he essentially, he'll go on to talk about how and we'll go into it, how carefully he's wording his connections with Harry and Meghan, because he's he's very giving us subtle clues about what might not be true. I'm not their friend. I've never sat down with Meghan privately for interviews. I've never uh, exchanged information with Meghan. But are you fighting their corner? No. It feels I like I have been, are. during Meghan's time as a working member of the royal family, I was extremely sympathetic for the mm. position she was in. So, 
It's very clear here. I've never met privately with Megan for an interview, but he could have met with her with other people. I have never gotten information from Megan. Well, you could have gotten information from Megan through somebody else to you. So this notion, this web he's weaving that he hopes you don't see demonstrates how he is trying to manipulate the situation to distance himself from Harry and Meghan to not only protect himself, but to protect them too, because I think there's a symbiotic relationship here between them. And so they scratch each other's back. And Omid is desperate, I think, for the Hollywood life Harry and Meghan leave. Because if you looked at his Instagram, he did this whole trip to California to research for Endgame. Why would he go to California? Why does he need to? Well, he's going to talk to Harry and Meghan's friends. And maybe again, he's not having a private lunch with Meghan. He's having a lunch secured at the Beverly Hills Hotel with a couple other people there so that they can chat. And it's a conversation. It's not an interview. Again, the wordplay there is very, very key. He's saying very specific things that are both true and misleading. And that is how he's weaving this. And he's not friends with Meghan, but he's friends of friends with Meghan. So he does have, again, this stronger connection and this idea, and Craig pushes him, good for Craig, going, well, you sound like their mouthpiece. I'm not but you sound like it because he does, because he only ever reports their things and negative things about the monarchy. They're always great, the monarchy's always terrible. You can't do that and still retain your authenticity. And if Omid cares about his reputation as a journalist at all, although I think he wants to be an influencer now like Megan, he needs to figure out what he's doing because he's digging himself a hole I don't think he can dig himself out of. And again, a lot of people I think within the general public, unfortunately, don't see past what he's saying. They're not looking between the lines. And so that's why I hope maybe you take something away or a different thought of what he said in this interview. And again, I recommend watching the whole thing and making your own conclusions. But Again, I will say strongly, strongly, strongly that Omid is misleading people in what he's saying here, in my opinion. Not restricted by some of the limitations of being a member of the British press and that relationship with the royal family. So I did go on television and talk about the racism that she faced. And rather than anyone wanting to talk about it or listen about it, I was called her fan, mouthpiece, cheerleader. Well, Omid, the problem is, is that that's only what you wanted to talk about, I think. Because I think other publications would be interested perhaps in maybe more what you wanted to say about other royals. But when it came to Harry and Meghan, all you wanted to do was talk about racism, talk about other things. You did not want to talk about other issues. And because of that, I don't think people could see you as anything else. And he complains, well, I got stuck with this role. Well, buddy, I got a very quick and simple fix for you. If that was the direction and the trajectory you saw yourself going, take two steps back and then criticize both sides. Criticize both sides, share positive stories about both sides. I will always say if I like something Meghan Markle wears, like an outfit, which is exceedingly rare, I will say so. And if I don't like an outfit of Catherine's, I will say so. And I know people don't always like that or agree with that, but that's fine, but that's authentic. That's what I'm trying to, I give you examples of what I try to do because I'm not perfect. I do have a bit of my biases, but I'm also trying to be clear here that I can criticize both sides, but he can't. And because of that, he has become their mouthpiece because he only does their things. He only promotes their things. That's the problem he's having that he officially refuses to recognize. Harry well, and Meghan. See, this is where I have a bit of a, and I don't mean to cut across Yeah, here. go for it. I find a lot of this content quite tabloidy too yeah so you know you, you, you gotta bear it, the brunt of it, that as it well delves as into... part of the american press crew you don't have a, a role within the the reporting pack over here with the royal family oh i want to bet you that really really turned omid screws when the guy said well you're part of the american press pack so you don't get the access and that is a, a, what a couple of reviewers have said is that I think it was the Telegraph that said, this is basically a hate letter from the guy who wasn't allowed in the Royal Rota. That is what this is about. But again, even if he could have eventually worked his way into the Royal Rota, he had gone so hard on Harry and Meghan. He was there at her last engagement. He wrote a book about them. And the palace was like, we can't really trust you because Harry and Meghan themselves have made themselves untrustworthy. You have attached yourself too hard to them and now you're not trustworthy. And so he lost all the access he's had. I think this is part of the pity party about that. He's enacting his revenge against the royals and to a certain extent, Harry and Meghan.
And again, I, I go, I applaud Craig here for again, pushing Omid on this relationship. It's not perfect, but I do think he deserves pushback and he gets it. We know Megan was in touch with the first book and, and, and sent some advice your Well, way. she wasn't in touch with the first book. Via an aid. She spoke to her communications officer and I discovered that okay. at the same time as the rest of the world. So it happened. But it's, um, so it happened. It's so, the job of a communications officer at the palace to deal with the press. So he is, oh, I love this. Craig is pushing him and Omid's like, well, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't personally hear from her. It was her aide. But it's like, but her aide gave him permission because she trusted Omid. Omid only got this information because he had a trust there that Carolyn Durand, I don't think had, or that another reporter might not have had. Would she have given the same access, the same information to Valentine Lowe? Probably not. Would she have given the same information to Robert Jobson, to, oh gosh, what, Katie Nichol, some of the other royal reporters we have, would she have given the same access to them? Because Omid got the review or the outline or whatever of the points Meghan Markle wanted him to hit because she wanted him to hit them. And that was because of personal relationships. So to deny that there was just this palace staffer in between and, you know, Omid and him just had no interaction, it's just, I think personally, a lie. There had to have been a personal connection. Why else would you give him access to things? Because you knew he was gonna write a favorable book. That's what you wanted him to do and that's what he did. Again, the clever wordplay here is very obnoxious, but also very telling in what he's saying. It would be very surprising that any of her staff or aides would talk to you. So people are questioning your sources. Can I ask you a question? Have sure. you ever had this conversation with people that write source quotes about Camilla Charles, William, Kate, do they ever get called friends of, mm -hmm. mouthpieces of, cheerleaders? Yes. So again, Omen is very, very sensitive about this label with Harry and Meghan, and specifically Meghan. But again, it's a label of his own creation. And not all royal reporters get pressed on this, I do agree. But I think the reason is, is that we know he is in cahoots with Harry and Meghan. He wrote the book about them, that she peed in a bush. How else would he know she peed in a bush unless she told him? There's just no other way. This notion this guy has that somehow he can worm his way out of these things, I just think is utterly ridiculous. It's just so abundantly clear where he stands and how he has gotten access to things. And he only seems to report on Harry and Meghan things. And because of that, wouldn't you know it, you only get access to Harry and Meghan things. And so you become their mouthpiece because of the decisions he has made. Again, I don't feel sorry for him. He's dug his hole and he has to live with it now. He has to live with where he put himself in his career. He has pigeonholed himself in his career to be Harry and Meghan's mouthpiece. And so yes, all royals have particular reporters they like. But they're not. They're, but they're open to answering questions from other reporters. They interact well with other reporters. Omid Scobie got special treatment, and because of that, he is now considered their mouthpiece. He has made himself that. It's not just the press. It's not just social media. He has done that to himself because he cannot have a good, decent conversation about the other royals anymore. Or is it simply because people don't like the narratives that I purport in my reporting because it makes people feel uncomfortable? And rather than us engage in healthy conversation and discourse about it, it's easier to sling a nickname at me or accuse me of something mm -hmm. that is quite frankly not true. Okay, I hate the whiny boy here. Stop whining, buddy. I get hate all the time too. You need to suck it up. You're not supposed to be reporting a narrative. You're supposed to be reporting the news. You're supposed to be reporting the news. If you want to report a narrative, I, I think I got off this tangent in, my, in one of my other questions. If you want to report a narrative, then you need to be a commentator, not a royal journalist or reporter. Again, it's clear, so clear where he stands here and yet that he refuses to acknowledge it. I find it so annoying. Just say you're Harry and Meghan's lapdog. Stop trying to say, oh no, I'm not. It's just the media. They just say such mean, nasty things about me. It's terrible. I am not responsible for any of it. And again, it's so Meghan Markle, is it not? But also unfair. I'm open to criticism and healthy conversation, but I also don't appreciate and have never appreciated the nonsense that has written about me. He's not open to criticism though. We've seen this throughout his social media in the last week. He's not open to criticism. He thinks all criticism is mean and unfounded. That's what he thinks. And I got blocked from Omid Scobie, but, but I never interacted directly with his posts. I would just take a screenshot of it and then react to it because I didn't really want to give him more 
let's say, reach than I had to. And I wanted to actually keep reading his stuff so I could just see what he was saying and respond to it. But he blocked me because he didn't like what I had to say. He didn't like my conversation. And now I understand it. I do block a lot of people on Twitter too, but that's just because sometimes people just bombard your account with things. Sometimes they're just super nasty and you can just tell they just are going to constantly hammer you with their pro Harry and Megan BS. And they're not interested in a decent conversation. If you ask a question respectfully, I respectfully respond, but we agree to disagree. I'm totally fine with that. Omid Scobie is not fine with that. He is not fine with criticism. Otherwise, he could have handled it when people didn't like his book. Firstly, I've never used the racist word when in this subject. Even the book makes it very clear that we're talking about unconscious bias here. And I realize that the alliteration of racist royal yeah. is a great headline, but that's not the subject at stake here. That is wrong. Omid Scobie has used that word in a different interview in regards to the other worlds. He says he doesn't even like unconscious bias. And I know Harry called it unconscious bias. I'm still going to call it racism because I think that it's only not racist when it's unconscious. The second someone makes it conscious to you and you try and minimize it or skirt, skirt the topic or recollections may vary it, <laughs> that is racism. Omid Scobie, the only person obsessed with racism within the royal family is Omid Scobie. Nobody else seems to be as obsessed with it as he is because I think, again, most people saw Megan's BS for what it was, especially after time went on. So nobody went after the racism narrative, which he, he asks here in a minute. Nobody cared about it because they didn't think any of it was true and they didn't put any credence in it or Meghan Markle's assertion. So they let it go because they're like, well, this was the vindictive actions of a vindictive woman. And so that's how they labeled it. But Omid Scobie, he is obsessed with race, just like Meghan Markle is. And he deflects accurate criticism from him, saying that's all because of race when it wasn't. A conversation that was raised about the color of Archie's skin that yeah. they called concerns and for me, it was important to get to the bottom of that. A, why was it not covered ever again? Why did the Sussexes never talk about it? What happened behind the scenes? The palace said it was dealt, being dealt with privately. Yeah. Was it? So what I think is interesting here is that Omid is almost mad Harry and Meghan didn't harp on it in the reality TV show. He wanted them to go into more detail. He wanted Harry and Meghan to rake the royals over the coals about it. That's what he wanted to do. And the, Harry and Meghan didn't give him that. And he's still mad about that. Which is so ridiculous, in my opinion, that he would somehow be mad about this is just so strange to me. And they wanted to handle it internally because recollections, like my shirt says, and I know some people have asked, and I am very much planning, I'm going to try to order more of these tonight to sell before Christmas. I know I've had a lot of questions about it and desires for it, so I will bring it back. But... If two people have different interpretations of a conversation and Catherine and Charles just say, because they were the ones named, just were asking, hey, I just wonder what Archie will look like. What do you think? We, you know, we have different thoughts or whatever. And that's what Megan's mad about. That's not a unconscious bias issue. That's just simply wondering what a newborn baby will look like. You know, all parents have this. Like my parents have, I would say, just generally a bit darker skin tone and darker hair. And I came out with blonde hair and blue eyes and very pale skin. It's just, you know, people just wonder, you know, genetics, what the child will look like. They even did this with the whales is doing composites. What will the kids look like? And that is some of the mystery and the fun of expecting a child. And Megan just twisted the knife into the royal family, which I just think is so deplorable of her. This is a family that is part of a publicly funded institution that is representative of Britain for our entire diverse country. And so, to ask questions about was the issue of race or potential unconscious bias dealt with properly. But what does he mean by dealt with properly? Because this is an internal family issue. This was an internal family conversation. Now, if it was a public issue in terms of a public statement or reaction or something like that, then his words here might have merit. But this was a private family issue. Nobody wants their family drama aired publicly. Who wants that? This was a private family matter. And what are they going to do to one of these people? Are they going to put them in like royal jail or something? That's just stupid. So what is he talking about? Is he demanding that they go through some DEI training or something like that, which is again, utterly ridiculous. Again, Omen, just what he's demanding here, what he's saying just doesn't make any sense. It's the matter the way things have played out since the book has come out. Um, primarily a name 
been named in the Dutch version of your book. Well, um, two names, two, two names. names. Um, that just seems bizarre to everybody out there because you don't accidentally put in a name and you can't put it down to a mistranslation, can you? It does feel like a stunt to sell books. I love that Craig asked this question. I think he set up the question too very well, saying you can't tell us that it's a translation issue. They're names. They're, that's not a translation issue. Love the way he asked that question. It really does turn the screws to Scobie and he does have to answer it. And it's very interesting how he does. And he does officially deny that it is a publicity stunt, but I think a lot a lot of people do feel like there's something nefarious going on here. And I mean, even if this was an accident, how Omid Scobie has handled it, I think is utterly deplorable because he is throwing a woman who he's supposedly, Omid Scobie is supposedly against misogyny. That's why he needs to defend Meghan Markle. But he's totally willing to destroy another woman's career as a translator to save his own hide. That's just despicable. It just is. Which I understand. I wish it was you know, the case. Okay. How did that happen? Um, you know, which... It's still being investigated right now. What do you think happened? I wrote and edited the English version of the book with one publisher. That, co that then gets man uh, licensed to other publishers. So watch what he does here. So he's asking, how did this happen? Well, I wrote the English version of the book and the English version of the book went to other people. And other than that, I don't know what happened. I don't know, that is his answer. And he stalls for this quite a bit. I did have to cut this clip down, but he meanders through all this internal things with publishing, not like super deep dive, but internal things with publishing that really have no merit on what the question was asked. Because the question was asked was, how did this happen? Because the only way this could have happened, especially because like, well, Discuss later, the Telegraph basically confirmed that the names that were mentioned were the names that Meghan Markle accused, then the Dutch publisher could have not made that up because they would have had to have the names. And you can't make up something that's not accurate. So clearly it was there. And so this thing, well, I just wrote the English version. I was like, okay, so you, do you just want the residuals from the English version? So you don't want residuals from the French version, German version, Spanish version, anything like that, because you just told us that it only really matters the English version. That's the only one you touched. So that should be the only one you get your money with. And I will give the Nightline person super big credit here because on BBC, she goes, well, doesn't the buck stop with you? And he's like, uh, no, no. And it's like, yeah, it does. It does because your name's on the stinking book. His name is on the book. If his name wasn't on the book, sure. But Omid Scobie, your name is on that book. I'm as frustrated as everyone else. I make it very clear in this book that I, in every way possible, want to adhere to the laws surrounding this subject. And it's why I've never spoken about it beyond what I've said in the public domain before. So again, he's skirting the question and he's also telling us that he knows the names and he deeply, deeply thought about putting them in the book. So doesn't that mean probably most likely that the names were written down in a draft somewhere? I think so, I think so. But he denies that, which is, I think a huge lie, a stupid lie that he should not have said. He did avoid it in the Dateline thing or the Nightline thing or whatever from BBC. I didn't notice that, that he didn't actually say that again because it's like, dude, you need to stop saying that because that is not accurate. Everybody knows that's not accurate anymore. The reality is though, is that this is information that is not privy just to me. Journalists across Fleet Street know, have known those names for a long time. We've all followed a certain code of conduct when it comes to talking about it. It's frustrating. So he also here throws Fleet Street under the bus saying they all knew too. Like, why is this my fault? Why is this my problem? They all knew. So are you saying that somebody from Fleet Street decided to go over to the Netherlands, get them a different draft of your stinking book or insert a couple of paragraphs that you didn't, like that's just absolute stupidity. That is just a stupid notion on the face of it. And what Omid Sco Scobie is saying here is that, you know, let's say there's a group of people and they rob a bank. Well, one guy is caught with the money. Is he just gonna go, well, it wasn't my fault. I didn't have anything to do with it. It's like, but the money's right there. The money's right there. Omid Scobie is skirting responsibility here. And it's cowardly. It's a cowardly thing to do. So he needs to own up to this because nobody's buying this. If you're buying this, I have a bridge in Alaska to sell you. But for me, I can only talk about the English version of the book that I wrote and produced. But are you and upset have never by been, it though? Are you have upset never by it that, that those names came out when it had nothing, you didn't want that to happen? I had never submitted a book that had their names in it. So I can only talk about my version. So key wording here. I only submitted my book. So it could have been a manuscript. It could have been a draft. It could have been 
something else that was submitted. Because again, the careful wordplay here is key. So it could have been a draft, it could have been a second draft, it could have been an almost final draft that they were given, but it wasn't the final book he gave them. That was the book, it wasn't the draft, it wasn't the manuscript. Again, that clever wordplay there. And again, they try to press him on us and he goes, well, I just know the English version. It's like, yeah, but they translated it from the English version. Like, I, I swear sometimes when I see things like this, I'm like, he must think we are all stupid as, as the day is long or something. He just thinks we're all morons that can't see through his lies. Cause I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. Because to be honest, I've been operating in a bubble of no emotion for the last 10 days, but I am frustrated about it, just like I am many of the other things that I've seen written or said about the book. And I also will say, I forgot to mention, he's not upset by it and he's not apologizing to the royals involved. He's not apologizing to, let's say even Harry and Meghan or the Dutch publisher he's throwing under the bus. He's not apologizing for anything because he did nothing wrong. And I love it. He's like, I've been in an emotionless bubble for the last 10 days. I hate that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff drives me bonkers. It's just so Hollywood and just weird and just stuff I don't like. And it's just absolute silliness. Because again, you can't take this guy seriously. That's the thing. He wants us all to take him seriously, but you can't take him seriously. Um, I also but you're, um, but you're a journalist. I am a journalist. And you know the effect a book like this has, so surely you can't be surprised by the reaction. I knew that it would be heated and controversial, absolutely. But I think that a lot of this has been simply about me. It's been unnecessary information about me. It's been unfair attacks about me. It's been an assassination of my character. Death my threats as well. The reality is that this book covers a lot of things that the British press don't want to talk about because they are part of it. And it's why it's so important. So again, lots and lots of whining here. Lots of whining. Oh, it's been so hard for me. People have been so mean. I don't have any sympathy for you, Omid. I really don't. I honestly don't. And again, he set this set up for himself. He decided to get into bed with Harry and Meghan. Figuratively, not literally. He decided to get into bed with them. He has been their champion. He has talked about their, their talking points all the time. And yet, and yet, he's telling us it's all our problem. It's not his problem, it's our problem. And that the criticism he's get, you know, it hurts his feelings and he can't handle it. And it's wine, wine, wine. And it's like, <sighs> you know, nobody should be giving you death threats, but the whining also needs to stop. You need to be, is this about facts or your feelings? Because I get the sense it's about feelings because this book is about him. It's not really about the royals, it's about him. And the fact that, according to the Telegraph, none of the royal advisors took this guy seriously. He kept trying to give them advice and they were like, what are you talking about? You have no place to give us advice about anything. And so again, Omid's complaining and whining here, I think is more, again, it's all about him. This is a book about him and he's a narcissist. He's vain, he's vapid, just like Meghan Markle. And so that is what he's reflecting here. Listen, I'm not asking people to buy this book, rent it from the library, but I want people to see it for themselves because this is a very different manuscript to the book being described in the pages of the press. I don't know if you, have you guys, already on it though. have you guys read it? I, I haven't read it. I've I'll been be through honest. an awful lot of it. Okay. So, <laughs> I, I mean, is the publisher happy? He's going, well, don't buy it. Go to the library and rent it. It's like, well, I don't think the publisher is too excited about that because the whole reason you're on that show and why they're paying you to go to these different places is so people will buy your book. And if they enacted this incredibly stupid publicity stunt, that could result in liable action, then why in the world would they want him to go, well, just rent it from the library. And this, again, this savior notion, it's like, you must read this book because it has the mysteries of the universe. I'm just like, no, no, it doesn't. Stop telling people that you can figure out the monarchy if you read his book. I mean, he doesn't even get basic facts right. And some of the intricate details of things, I probably don't know either, to be quite honest, I know quite a lot about how rails operate in general. And so I would say in some instances, I could probably write a better book than he could. But again, the whining, stop the whining. Some of the re reviews, and actually it's interesting. Hmm. I've read all the papers, okay? Yeah. Left, right, down the middle, the whole lot, yeah. New York Times. And there is a general feel that a lot of the information was out there already and you've put your spin on it. And I guess one of the questions people are asking, why, what's your end game? I 
I love this question. And I love it almost could be, I mean, he almost could be looking down, but you never see this face in any other portion of the interview. Cause I watched the whole interview and he, you know, he looks down a lot and he doesn't, I don't think he does a great job. I don't think selling himself as very confident in his work, but he goes, so let's, let's watch this a little bit again here. See that, that little, oh, like kind of like, Mm, notion that he does right there because he's saying that I've read all the reviews and basically they're all saying there ain't nothing new in this work except for your interpretation of it. That is so good. That is so good. And I think Craig is confident in saying that. He comes across very, very well in this interview. Omid does not. Rochelle doesn't do that much, but Craig, he is on this. And you can tell he's read this book and you can tell he's a little bit frustrated by this. And there's a great question towards the end here, where she just looks at Omid and he goes, well, people don't like you. People hate this book. What do you got to say about that? <laughs> It's just kind of awesome. So I love this question though, because it really does push him going, I've read this or at least a good chunk of it. And there's nothing really new in here. That's all that interesting. It's just your rehashing of things that have already happened in your interpretation of it. So what are we supposed to gain from this book? What is your end game omen? No, for me, I feel that we've reached a pinnacle moment with the Royal family where we are having conversations about the purpose, relevancy and future of the Royal family. So for me to ask the question, do the current working royals all still uphold those same morals, values and ethics, not just in front of the cameras, but behind palace walls, I think is a legitimate question to ask. Caught in a world where we can scrutinize the royal family in the same way we do politicians. These are not celebrities just there to be written about in a fun way. This is also an establishment at the heart of our country. But he won't allow people to criticize Harry and Meghan. And he does explain a little bit of his reasoning later, which I think is incredibly stupid and asinine. But this notion that he's presenting here that we need to question him, of course, question certain things. Reporters do that all the time when it comes to the Royals. This is not new information. What he's talking about is not new at all. He just doesn't like where it's going. He just doesn't like that they don't want him to do it, that he doesn't have a voice. He doesn't have a place within the Royal Rota to really question them. That is his frustration. And the fact that they didn't really like him. I think that's a key point there too. You believe in the monarchy? I do actually. Do you want the monarchy to exist? If you had read the book, you'll see that there are yeah, many aspects. I look forward to it. Uh, many aspects of the monarchy I appreciate and have been proud of, but there are also many moments I feel that don't represent the Britain that we should be in today. But what is he talking about the Britain we should be in today? I think again, this is a very personal notion that Omid Scobie has and that we should just diversify the whole royal family. Kick out those who don't meet the racial quota that we need to have now and just usher new people in. That's not how the royal family works. And Britain at its heart, when it was founded thousands of years ago, were settled by white people. So it's not a surprise that the thousand year institution of the monarchy is inhabited mostly by white people because Britain a thousand years ago, although it was French and was invaded, was mostly white. So why would you expect something else? Again, kind of the reasoning there is sort of stupid. And I understand that there may be some issues regarding diversity within the royal staff that's totally different. But within the family itself, not so much. And again, what does he want? So are we going to force arranged marriages between some of the princes that we have in Africa and the Middle East in order to fulfill Omid Scobie's, you know, whatever quota he has? I just don't think how he's presenting his questions here is valid. And I think there are good conversations to have. He's just not the messenger of those conversations because he doesn't have the validity to do so. He lost his validity years ago when he decided to get in bed with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And what I thought was interesting too here is that Craig kind of, and I feel like this is what I'm interpreting. So do with it what you will. I feel like Craig is saying too, it's like, I get the notions that you're asking, but I didn't see that in the book. Am I going to come across it in the book? And almost he's like, well, if you read the book, I'm sure Craig is there sitting there going, I did read a good chunk of the book and I didn't see what you're talking about here. Because again, Omid has gone way too far in on the Harry and Meghan narrative. And he cannot make this thing work because he's too devoted to selling their story. It's not about Harry and Meghan having unfair press. I think for me, the interest, and listen, Firstly, I want to say Harry and Meghan don't appear in this book until 100, page 146. I say on like very early on, they are irrelevant to the future of the royal family. So if they are relevant, Omid Scobie, why do you even cover them? 
why do you cover him at all? And I actually went through and actually listed and looked. So even though Meghan Markle is irrelevant, she was mentioned 303 times, Kate 287 times, William 527 times, Harry 482 times, Charles 589 times, Camilla 220 times, and Diana 148 times. So if Meghan Markle and Prince Harry are irrelevant, why mention them so much? If they have nothing to do with the future of the monarchy, then leave them out. The problem is, is that Harry and Meghan are having, even though they've left, are having too much influence on the monarchy in terms that they are, because of their antics and actions, they are pulling the monarchy into their games and disrepute. That's why Charles has to be put on his big boy pants and make some really, really tough decisions about the future of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And he has to give up this dream that somehow they're gonna become amenable to this conversation. They are not. But I do think when Meghan was a working member of the royal family, she was massively misrepresented yeah. in a lot of the coverage. I think a lot of it was steeped in xenophobia, misogyny and prejudice. And I've always said that very loudly from the start. And it's the thing that has made me. Yeah, it's the thing that's made him and broken him in a lot of ways. He went a bit too hard on that. He couldn't see perhaps that some of this criticism was well-founded and he came at it maybe even you could say from too much of an American perspective at the time because there are clearly things she did wrong like spending $100,000 on a maternity dress is a stupid decision. Spending about that much, $75,000 on an engagement dress for a photo shoot was a stupid decision. And again, there were a lot of stupid decisions that Meghan Markle made while she was a member of the royal family. I have very little interest in what they're doing in California, etc. And this ridiculous notion that he has no desire to know what they're doing in California. I was like, well, why were you outside Nobu taking a picture of this very, very nice Mercedes SUV that would probably cost over six figures? Omid Scobie is very invested in Harry and Meghan, very invested in them, very invested in their flashy lifestyle because he wants it to. That's why he flew on a private jet and then when challenged on that in the Times, deleted the picture which is incredibly stupid to do because it's like the picture's already there. They're going to mention that you've already lied about your age. Again, what else is this guy willing to lie about? Think a lot. And so how can you trust anything in this book? The answer is you can't. A target for many people in terms of someone who is just seen as like some mouthy fan mm. of her rather than perhaps, okay, I'm a mixed race member of the press pack and I've got something different to say about it. So again, he's obsessed with race. I'm mixed race, so I have something better to say than everybody else because I'm mixed race. In some instances, may that, maybe that applies, but if you don't know as much as the rest of the Royal Rota, then maybe your voice wasn't heard because you didn't really have a good opinion to share. That could be it too. Again, and nobody's required to listen to you because you are mixed race. Nobody is required to listen to you because of that. Nobody's required to listen to me either. You choose to listen to this channel. You don't have to, you choose to. And this just notion here that it's just so stinking arrogant because he has something to say and everybody should listen because he is mixed race and he is important. That is what he's promoting there. And again, he has created this own conundrum for himself by going too hard with Harry and Meghan. If he hadn't done that, he may still have some respectability. He doesn't anymore, and he has to own that. That's such an interesting conversation. Yeah. And I would have loved to have seen a book that spoke about that and looked at There's the future 20, of the 20,000 words on race and the royals. Yeah. It's the deepest dive on the subject, and not one article that is out there today has written a word about that section. Nobody cares what I wrote about that section. Yeah, because you come at it from too personal a perspective here. And I love Craig asking, I would have liked that conversation in the book. And it wasn't in the book or done well. That's the thing too. There could have been a conversation there, but Omen wasn't the one to bring it up. Omen wasn't the one to convey it well at all. And this is why everybody's reacting negatively to it. And you can almost see maybe Omen's getting a big and emotional because it's like, this is so passionate for me. It's like, but if this is all about you, where do the royals fit in? Because you're not, this is all an emotional journey for him. This is not about research facts and trying to portray a complex situation well, which I think Valentine Lowe in his book does very well. And I think Tom Bauer does it very well too in Revenge, which I think is a decent look at Meghan Markle. Is all of it true? Maybe, maybe not, but I think it's well-researched. And Courtier's, of course, is exceptionally well-researched. But Omid Scobie is coming from this place of feelings. I feel, I'm mixed race. So I need to write this book and I need to talk about research because it's important to me. Not maybe that's important to the institution. Maybe not even that important to Harry and Meghan. Not even important to their kids. It's important to me so I have to spin all these facts to justify my own personal bias.
That is what this tells you about Omid Scobie. This is all about him and his personal feelings about this. And because of that, you can't really trust what he's saying because if this is all emotionally driven, that he can't be objective. He can't be objective. And ob objectivity is key. Yes, everybody has their bias, and of course it always seeps in, it always does, but Omid cannot be objective. And because of that, this book needs to be dismissed because this guy has no objectivity on this topic. Would you have written it differently now if you did it today? No, because I, re I wrote it without fear or favor yeah. to anyone. Maybe he doesn't think he needs to do it better, but I think everybody else thinks he should have done it better. And he should have been able to convey his information better. And he should not have to totally rely on his feelings in order to get his point across. Deal in facts, deal in facts, and then maybe you can talk about your feelings. Just a quick word to the public. It's their monarchy. Yeah. It's their king. What would you say to them in their anger this morning with your, your book out there? What would you say? I would say that this book is written to sit at the heart of the conversation about the purpose, relevancy, and future of the royal family. I love how Craig asks them, Britons are waking up. They're angry at you. They hate this book. What is your response to them? And he's like, well, I just want this to be at the center of a conversation. It's like, yeah, no, you kind of lost that privilege. You kind of lost that privilege. I think there's a book I have. Let me look it up here because it's actually on my Kindle. And I read this ages ago and I need to reread this. And it's been a long time. It's called The Great Survivors, How Monarchy Made It Into the 21st Century. This is by Peter Conradi. And you see on the cover, Queen Elizabeth, Prince Philip. You see the King of the Belgians, the former King of the Belgians, King, King Wilhelm Alexander now and his wife Maxima. You have King Carl Gustav. You have King Philippe before he became King, Catherine and William. And you have Albert and Charlene of Monaco. So this is from the author of The King's Speech. Now that to me might be interesting because I feel like this is a more even take on the topic. And it's been a long time since I've read this, but I remember liking it and I remember finishing it, which I don't always do sometimes. So that tells you it was pretty good. So I would probably recommend that over Omid Scobie's book because again, Omid Scobie is all coming about from his personal perspective, his emotional drive. That is what's driving this book, not facts. You can't have a decent, compelling conversation when somebody is all about obsessing about their emotions because you can't have a conversation with somebody like that. It just doesn't work unless you're in a personal relationship. But to have a conversation about the monarchy, you need a critical eye, which Omid Scobie has and doesn't have because he has a critical eye for what he thinks are the problems. Now, granted, we all have our personal opinions, but again, looking at the monarchy and accurately dissecting what is working and what is not is something he cannot do. Whether some of the subjects in the book make people uncomfortable or not, they are still conversations we should be had. You can leave that book feeling stronger about the monarchy than ever before, or you can leave that book feeling like, actually, there are some more things that I'd like public discourse about. But again, some of the public discourse things he's talking about, is like, how do you have those open discussions? How do you have those open forums? And if it's about a personal family issue, why are we dredging them up and having them go to court over a personal family issue? That's just not even appropriate for most people. Most people wouldn't want that about their family. And so we also have to discuss here the release of a statement that was at least not quoted, but included in an article by The Telegraph. And we know that Harry and Meghan sometimes prefer The Telegraph as their preferred UK outlet. And they said, sources close to the Duchess of Sussex who named the pair in a letter she wrote to the king have insisted she never intended them to be publicly identified and that the letter was not leaked to Scobie by anyone in her camp. Once again, throwing the monarchy under the bus, which it does not deserve. I think 100% this came from Harry and Meghan. Who else could this have come from? Seriously, who else? We've been told there's a report in the Sun saying that this letter is under lock and key. It was pretty much only for Charles's eyes, and I'm sure that could have been assured. And why would a royal staff member leak this? It just doesn't make any sense. The only person this benefits is Meghan Markle. And again, I just don't understand why she doesn't see that and why we all see through this. But I told you I would end with this and we will talk about what the Times of London had to say because I think the British people are getting completely fed up with the Sussex nonsense and Charles needs to put a lid on it more severely on Harry and Meghan because they're not gonna change, they're not gonna adjust, it's Charles's issue now.
This is what the Times said. The Times view on the Sussexes, entitled it says, Harry and Meghan cannot keep rubbishing the royals while retaining their honorifics. Says Omid Scobie, the writer known as the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's unofficial mouthpiece, denies they cooperated with him on his second surrealist book about the institution the couple stepped back from almost four years ago. But then he denied collaborating with the Sussexes on his first book, too, just as they insisted that they had not contributed to that book. Until that is, Meghan Markle revealed under oath that she had sent briefing notes to an aide prior to his meeting Scobie. The couple have said only through sources that they are not a affiliated with the latest book. It is still reasonable to presume that the Sussexes at the very least may have given their blessing to Scobie's new collection of largely unsubstantiated Windsor bashing allegations. Far from seeking the quiet life and reconciliation they claim to desire, it looks instead as if Harry and Meghan are inflicting maximum public reputational damage on their relatives and the institution to which those individuals belong. In calling his new book Endgame, Scobie is posturing as chronicler and prophet of the fall of the House of Windsor. Having quit the royal family, the Sussexes now seem intent on destroying it. And yet, they persist in not only clinging on to their noble titles, but using those titles freely and frequently, not least when pursuing commercial gain and influence. Moreover, they have ostentatiously styled their young son and daughter as Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet, respectively. This self-serving attachment to the trappings of a family and an institution which they have otherwise rejected and continue to trash is hypocritical and distasteful. If the Sussexes had any shame, they would decide to be the Sussexes no longer. As it is, there are 30 dukes in the peerages of Britain and Ireland. King Charles would not be blamed if he acted to reduce that number to 29. And I think Charles should take that advice. I mean, it's technically Parliament's decision, but I think the easy first step for Charles would be to take Harry and Meghan off the website. I guess apparently there's an article from the Daily Mail saying that Charles doesn't want to humiliate his son. It's like, well, sometimes tough love is tough love and you need to exhibit some of that right now. There needs to be some tough love time because this is not going to end. So you need to protect yourself because Harry and Meghan don't care. Meghan Markle doesn't care how much she hurts you, the royal family, George, Charlotte, Louis. She doesn't care. She's all in this for her own game and she's willing to do any and everything to pursue her own agenda. And the royals need to take the same advice and act in the same manner. This is absolutely critical. So guys, let me know what you think of this video. Let me know what you think of this massive, massive Omitscobie debacle. This is unbelievable. It's terrible and it's awful. And Omid Scobie needs to start really, really apologizing to the royals and the public for misleading them, I think. I have to just add, I think, for specific reasons. But I think Omid Scobie has been telling some pretty tall tales these last couple of days. So guys, let me know what you thought. I'd love to hear from you and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.